Hello and welcome to the Carner Talks podcast. Uh, this is week three. If you haven't joined us, definitely watch the last two. We're going to be doing this every Saturday. Uh, eventually we'll do it live, but there's some sort of virus going around that's stopping me from getting to places. If, if anyone can let me know what that's about, that'd be great. I'm joined today by three fantastic Drive Tribe creators. And uh, as always, I'm going to annoyingly go in alphabetical order just to piss off Robert uh, sitting there uh, and jump around the group. So, uh, Alex, if you want to just introduce yourself and tell everyone a bit about you. Oh, hello, Alex LaPerriere, content creator for Drive Tribe. Perfect. Um, I, I guess that's short and sweet. We'll go. Yeah. <laughs> I'll put a link to his Drive Tribe in the description, just like everyone else. Uh, Charles, go ahead. Hi, I'm Charles North Six, and I am also a content creator on drivetribe.com perfect <laughs> <laughs> um and robert last but not least right yeah i'm i'm robert percy i'm a content creator on drive tribe and i also write for some other places as well so i've i've bounced around a few other places but i do like the majority of my stuff at the moment on drive tribe Perfect. Okay, well, we're going to start off this podcast by being a little bit topical and talking about this uh, virus that's been going around um, and how it's affected the auto industry. So I guess where we will start is uh, the news today. Tesla has, has closed or been ordered to close its factory, so it looks like they're going to be behind. I think uh, if you guys don't know, I think Mercedes and BMW were the same in Germany for quite a while, and Lamborghini just reopened. Um so yeah, I, I don't know. Is is it boring to talk about factory closures, or should we? Should well, we move I on mean, to it's, it's <laughs> funny to talk about that, but now people waiting for the Tesla it already takes two years for them to get them back, and now it's probably going to be four years until they get back. And they we need to wait even more. Yeah, yeah. It's very yeah. Thought for all yeah. the poor people who are still who who paid like the ten thousand deposit or whatever it was on the Tesla Roadster, and they're not going to get them for like another two years. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I, I also find it funny that you said poor people and Tesla in the same sentence. But anyway, sorry, Charles, go ahead. Uh, okay. um, now, not only does closing down factories you know, affect the consumer, it also affects the employees too, because I don't know if they're making any money being sent home. So that sucks for them in the same, in the same breath. Yeah, I would imagine with some manufacturers, perhaps. I imagine with Tesla, probably not. Um so yeah, it's definitely unfortunate, and I'm not sure what the situation in America is. I know, I know in in Ireland, my my home country, you uh, if you can't work right now, the government is covering seventy percent of your wage. But in a lot of countries, that's not the that's not the case, you know. Uh, yeah, there's a um, a furlough scheme going on at the moment in the UK where people are getting they well, like, people are getting paid whilst they're not working, but like yeah. Not everyone's getting it. There's like a lot of exceptions and people are kind of getting annoyed about, annoyed about that. But like most people are getting paid when they're at home. And some people yeah. like some people as well, like myself and my dad, we're still able to work. So we're mm. just doing what we normally do, except from home. You yeah. Know? The people making money are like uh, customer service and the PR people. Um, yeah. In, in America, there's uh, the people who aren't working, uh, they'll get unemployment and then the government's giving them like an extra six hundred dollars a week to help out and okay that's, well, get it yeah. some some people don't yeah. get it yeah no it's crazy so let's move from that depressing note onto an even more depressing note um there's been a lot of cars cancelled and moved back because of this damn thing um so i guess alex you were uh you want to bring up the vision m next which is one of them um which i guess we can talk about well, I wrote an article about that. It must have been when I was first starting off on Drive Tribe, and it actually did surprisingly well. And I never even realized how dedicated BMW was to having that thing built until I started seeing their tweets more and more. It's like, Vision M coming to you soon and all that. So everybody got super hyped up. It's like, yes, we're going to get the Vision M. And then they were like, oh, coronavirus canceled it. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it's really a shame as well because that would have been the third, I think, third ever mid-engined BMW, going back yeah. to the M1 in '78, I think it was or '70. Yeah, and that's so, a beautiful car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think designed, I think designed by Vision, Lamborghini. I think the Vision <laughs> M was tribute to the M1, right? 
Yeah, was so was the BMW i8, which is its predecessor. So yeah, yeah. Um, what else has been cancelled and moved back that we were discussing? Uh, Rivian. Uh, yeah, is, Rivian. is Rivian moved back? Because I know no, the well, Ford and Lincoln thing is. Well, no, no, no. What what I meant? Well, it's the the Rivian based Lincoln that was supposed yes. to be happening. That's that been was... completely cancelled, right? Yeah, that was scrapped. Yeah. Yeah. I'm quite. I'm kind of quite sad that that's been cancelled because that could have been a really, really good car. Yeah. Like it had like. All... Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. Silence. Yeah. Um, yeah. That could have been a really good car. It looked like it, on paper it would be really good because it had the Rivian platform on it. But like because it, it was a Lincoln, it would be looked like a Lincoln. I think like the current Lincolns look pretty cool. Yeah. And so, In all uh, honesty. It probably would have had a good warranty on it too, coming knowing that's coming from Lincoln and all of that. So you're gonna have the new powertrain. So some people might be also about that, but then they'll have the warranty, factory warranty with that. So Oh yeah, yeah. it could have been a good yeah. sales figure for them as well. Yeah. And the the Hummer is pushed back as well, which doesn't yeah. help. Yeah. 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 They spent so much money on that. Like they did the Super Bowl commercial and all of that. It's kind of I, I all think, the hype is dying down. I, I think though it'll still be a success regardless, to be honest. I think it's uh it's a great idea to bring in a Hummer, which was this kind of ridiculous military truck, but then fit it with an engine that doesn't like completely kill every you know, everything it passes. So um yeah, I, I think, think it'll like, still sell. Like, I mean, like Arnie himself has an electric one, so it's like, so it's okay, you know, like. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and he's the spokesman the for it, so. Yeah, the Hummer Lord has an electric Hummer, so it's perfectly acceptable. <laughs> sort of... Yeah, now people then, could, uh, now people could have actually driven it instead of worrying about you know a horrible fuel economy. Now they have to worry about a maybe a bad battery <laughs> life. Or what did that thing get? It must have got what like ten miles to the gallon or less. Right. Something like that. I remember a comedian did a stand-up bit and said, "Honey, look at our new lawn ornament because it just got that horrible of gas mileage." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and speaking of horrific-looking trucks, um, the cyber truck is on uh, is on track, though. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your outlook. <laughs> I'm gonna use that as a doorstop. <laughs> it's a very expensive doorstop. You get. Yeah, you, you could get two used F-150s for that. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, they've also I, pushed back well, the I, Tesla Roadster as well, I think. Yeah, so. that was till 2021. That'll take yeah. a while before they can fully develop that, because if it's going to be what they say it'll be, it'll be yeah. awesome when it comes out, but it'll take them a great bit of time before it comes out. I do understand why musk's reasoning as to why the droids has been delayed so much because i think it is going to be like a fairly limited production car like they're not going to make as many roasters yeah. as they will make cyber trucks yeah so like so yeah i think so yeah i think you said something like all the rest of the stuff we're doing is like the meat and potatoes of the business and like the this the roadster is like the halo car so they're, they're not to the they're gonna want to have everything else done that's going to make money before like they do the really crazy yeah. things. so they yeah. want what is it he said that he said on the podcast uh, with joe rogan that he basically wants to finish the cyber truck and then the semi truck before he touches the the roadster production um, yeah, to be honest, yeah. That's, that's, uh, i would agree with him on that you know, yeah sort of like this, makes great this, sense. the semi um the semi could actually potentially be a big money project for him if they get it right actually, well I, I guess that actually but when kind of makes it, sense but I guess, what, what was it? it? There was only like, I think it's like 7,000 of those semi-trucks sold a year globally or something. They're quite low run. Um, and that's for all of the manufacturers included. So I, I don't know how much money they'll make there off a semi-truck. Unless... Well, the way that I'm thinking is, is that obviously it's going to be, it's going to take a lot of money to make the Roadster. So... Given where the pickup truck market is, at least in the United States, so focusing on the Tesla Cybertruck on this, if they yep. could develop the Cybertruck and get people to actually fully pay off, not just a little 
kind of like pre-order fund that you need to pay. That'll give them a nice base so they can further develop the roadster. So in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I think it's time to stop talking about Elon Musk because we talk about him every week. Um, So we're going to jump into a really good note here. Uh, Charles, I hear they're putting a Hellcat in something ridiculous. Yeah, uh, I was reading up on a story on Drive Tribe where a what was it? A, a guy was thrown in a Hellcat motor inside an already SRT Dodge Magnum, or they're taking Dodge Magnums, which is a um, a wagon, and throwing it in there. Just and I think they're also doing a facelift too to it to make it look like a current Charger. So oh, I was no. I was reading up on that. I'm like. All right, that's something I can get behind and I can actually want to do, even myself, even if I can't spend the money to have him do it. I was like, all right, I got to talk about this. So yeah. um, with that being said, um, yeah, it was built to look like a Charger Hellcat, but it's got the wagon. Um, so what are those things pump? They pump like 840 horsepower or something, right? Those Hellcat engines. 707. I think the Demon is actually, uh, was it 840 or something like that? Yeah, sorry, you're right. It is the Demon. Yeah, yeah. I'd want to come on and put the Demon engine in there. Or actually, it's the same Hellcat <laughs> engine. Just you, I think it's a bigger supercharger. I would, I would just yeah. put way more yeah. power to it and send it yeah. into a wall. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing it's, uh, how capable they can make those, the Hemis, man. What, what, I, what I love about them is the fact that you get two keys. So you can yeah. keep the red yeah. one with the like 700 horsepower of yourself, and then the black one you give to like people you don't like when they want to borrow your car. You know, like, yeah, pretty much. But, <laughs> but it limits it. I love that it limits it to 500 horsepower, as if that's somehow not enough. Love you know, it's it. like, here, look, take this and just be careful. It's only got 500 horsepower now. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the work is done by JFab, and they're apparently going to be making a conversion kit for all of us if we wanted to ever do it. So it's like a, that's it's, awesome. So it's exciting. How much is going to cost? They don't say, but uh, uh, yeah. Well, how much is it? You can buy the Hellcat engine right directly. It's like a Hell crate. Oh and yeah, you can just buy yeah. With any engine. How much they cost? I think that's, I think that's like twenty grand or something though. Uh, it could be because I remember I wanted to stupidly put a uh, a 6.2 liter supercharged engine that you find in the Camaro ZL1 yeah. in my IROC, which is from 1987, <laughs> just because I wanted power. And that cost uh, around the ballpark of thirteen, fourteen thousand dollars $14,000 in 2012, 2013. Yeah. Well, I just, I just looked it up now. The Hell Crate. It's the 6.2 liter supercharged Hemi's, almost 20,000, 19,530. Yeah. That Magnum that engine in sort of sounds quite similar to an idea that I had a while ago. Where I was like, what if I got like a uh, an old Mercedes estate from like the 80s or 90s and put like an put like an E63 drivetrain in it? <laughs> yeah. You could. Yeah. It's like a. A friend of mine back years ago, uh, we took a, um, it was very popular at the time, is to put Hayabusa engines from the motorbikes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Strip, out, yeah. strip out an old Mini Cooper and put the engine in the back directly to the rear wheels. And uh, we, I've driven one of those and it was fucking nuts, man. Like, really yeah, insane. I've, I've seen people putting, like, doing the Hayabusa swap in, swap in smart cars and it makes them yeah. way too powerful. It's yeah, somebody put a insane. jet in a smart car and sent it down the track. I don't know how fast it went, but I I knew it flew. Almost. That, it, it, it reminds it me of the, driving, was it? Uh, <laughs> it reminds me of that uh, if you remember what Aston did to get like their emissions rate lower, they took like I think it was like an old Toyota and they made it. The they sold the, the Cigna, yeah. And then they put like a giant Aston V8 in front of it, I think, or something like that. That's funny because you it. mentioned that because like not long ago, I was actually joking about like how ridiculous the marketing was to um, Alanis King, who used to work at Jalopnik. <laughs> we, were, we were like having a joke on Twitter about like how ridiculous the whole car, the Signet was. 
So what was the, the signet, if I remember correctly, and I think you just said it there, Alex, was just brought in purely to keep their emissions balance down over the whole range, right? Yeah, they, they, I'm pretty sure they had to sell, sell 10,000 of them, and I don't even know if they got there. Oh, God. <laughs> It literally, it's like it's literally like a Toyota IQ with an Aston Martin interior. It's hilarious. I, I, I kind of, I would love to get a used one now, just so when someone oh, asks, like, "What do you drive?" That's you know, I'm like, "Oh, I drive an Aston Martin." You know. You do see <laughs> you like, like a few of them pop up occasionally on Auto Trader in the UK. They do sometimes pop up for sale. I've even seen a couple of them out in the wild, like sometimes. Well, how, how much do you think? Disappointment. Like, disappointment in your face when you see like when someone tells you what car you drive Aston Martin you go to their house and you pop up with like what looks like a Toyota that's been rebadged it's like oh, disappointment no. on their face no there's, there's another worse one I was at a car show um, not too long ago and there was a Maserati I, I don't I can't recall the name at the moment I just only know it as a Chrysler Le, LeBaron and yes. it was pretty much oh, that. I think I know which one you're much talking that, about. But Baz as an ass, uh, as a uh, Maserati. I was like, ew. I just walked away. Didn't like, they actually oh. have a Maserati <laughs> engine though? That's the thing. Yeah, it was like, it was it was rubbish looking. I was like, oh no. I just I, I just yeah. I'm I, I wanna I wanna that was, I really want to make a sleeper car at some point. Like, I'm thinking of just taking the worst. Like, what I want to do is actually buy, like, one of the cheapest normal sedans you can buy in, say, the U.S. or here in Mexico. And then just order one of those hell crates and just swap it out and change nothing else. Like, nothing else. So the car just looks completely stock. But when you put your foot down, it's like, holy, what the fuck is that thing, you know? Because that, that would be so much. Yeah. Um, put, that in, uh, put that in one of them... Dodge Caravans or something. Oh, that'd be <laughs> hilarious. Put it in Don't a Chrysler. A yeah. Or, yeah. or uh, put it in a Plymouth Prowler or whatever, or the Chrysler Prow- Prowler. That would be, that'd be, that'd be a good cool. problem. Is, that, I, I'm quite a confident person, but even I couldn't be seen in a, Chry- in a Plymouth Prowler. Like that would. That's my dad's dream car. That's gutsy. Oh, dear God. <laughs> <laughs> and he also likes a Lamborghini. Thank you so much. But yeah, uh, well, even just taking one of those like Dodge Hellcrates and putting it in like a Dodge Altitude or Neon, like one of their low end cars. Put it in yeah. a DeLorean. Yeah, you can get put, Neons. Put you the Hellcat should... engine in a DeLorean. That is a uh, terrible. That definitely yeah. 80 miles an hour. No, well, they wouldn't because it would fall apart on the way to 88 miles an hour because that thing is built so shoddily. Well, yeah. I mean, you bring that up, but what the Hellcrate? Wouldn't that just destroy the neon? Because the neon was such a piece of crap when it was new. That the neon would just break. Just use a whole bunch of duct tape. You'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just... I don't know. I, yeah, I need to put it in something. I want to I wanna build a kit car at some point as well, and I think a Hellcrate would be ideal for that. Like an old... You know, maybe the factory like, five or something. Maybe order like a kit from Ultima or something, and instead of using the engine that they prefer, just put the Hellcrate tra- drive train in it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but what, what what people do right with that Hellcrate motors, they actually put in like the old uh, Dodge Challengers, the old Chargers, and even like the Barracudas. I've seen yeah. pictures of that, and they that's that's when you take new stuff and you put it with the old stuff. That's when you blend it in perfectly. That's always Resto mod. Yeah, the problem with that though is. Uh, I don't know how comfortable I'd feel sitting in an old 70s car knowing it has 707 horsepower under the hood. Because I feel like I would just kill myself on the first five minutes of the drive. Like, you're well, let me put this way. Yeah, that's the fun bit. They are heavily that reworked. Tired. I it think like, it has totally modern, modern suspension. Uh-huh. That's yeah, the like, fun bit with the uh, Resto mod. Like, if you watch Tyler Hoover, he bought an old Mustang Fastback. Yes. That had been Resto mod. It had a totally rebuilt engine from the rear, like the differentials to the suspension and everything like that. Everything had been rebuilt. It's like, yeah. and it still looks exactly like how it was new. Just yeah, everything else has been redone. I, I don't know if I trust myself with a fast car just because uh, I had a 1.6 liter Chevrolet Aveo when I moved here. And I don't know if you are aware of the Chevrolet Aveo. It's not exactly a fast car. 
Uh, but I managed to land it on its roof one night with my brother-in-law in it as well. Um, so, <laughs> so I don't know if I trust myself in a 700 horsepower uh, Dodge. I don't know if that's a good idea. Um, I guess that's a good segue into uh, Rob. You want to take us through your cars that should have been good but weren't and let us all see if we agree with you or not on these cars. Okay, so, um, yeah, first of all, this article wasn't actually my idea. It was actually my mum's idea. So this is an article. This is an article that should have been bad, but wasn't. <laughs> well, um, well, the thing is, is like I had a writer's block, and I was basically, I, so I basically went to go and talk to my mum, and I was like, uh, "What the hell should I write about?" And then she suggested this, and I was like, "Oh, actually, this could be really cool," and it's done quite well. So yeah, cheers, mum. <laughs> anyway, I hope your mum joins uh, Drive Tribe and ends up higher on the leaderboard than you. That would be amazing. <laughs> no, I don't think she's going to be on. I don't think she's going to be on drive drive. She does have good taste in cars, though. Her favourite car ever is the Aston Martin DB9. So That is a beautiful, yeah, stunning car. Yeah, so basically but the whole sense. idea of, of this article was me being like, okay, what car should have been really awesome but then turned out to be pretty bad? And yeah. Which is why I've got things like the Alfa Romeo Arna on it. That should have been a good car, I think, because... I mean, like, if you, if you think about an Italian-Japanese partnership, you'd think, oh, have the Italians style it and make it drive good and have the Japanese build it so it doesn't fall apart. And they did the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, That's hang on. What happens? So they put an Italian en engine in it and styled it by the Japanese. Yeah, it looked like it looks like a Nissan Cherry from like the 1970s, but it's got the it's got the um, the oily bits and electrics from an Alpha Sud. <laughs> <laughs> Dear God! Yeah, they That's did like, that. Before. Yeah, that is that is literally the. That's the exact idea of taking all the worst parts that you've left over somewhere and going, look, we need to use it for something. Let's build a car. You know? yeah, <laughs> yeah. I I talked about the um, the Ford Pinto as well, which um, is pretty well known as being a car that should have been good, but that ended up being catastrophically bad because it was hilariously unsafe. Yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah. Let's probably like one of that, and I, I included the Corvair on there as well because they were two like two big sort of lawsuit type stories because of safety. So like, yeah, I mean, like the Cor but the thing is, the Corvair wasn't actually a bad car. The problem is, is just like a lot of people didn't really know how to handle it. Yeah, I mean, there were people who knew how to handle it. <laughs> You know, yeah. I, I, I've seen I've seen that at car shows, too. People always bring those old Corvairs. It's not the biggest scene, but it's, you know, they do show up at every car show. You can guarantee at least maybe three or four might be at a car show where I live and they do them nice. Yeah. They look nice and they sound nice, too. Even the original manufacturers uh, build, they they all have greatness to them and they should have been good. I guess the problem is, I think I actually said this in the articles. So like, the problem is, is that, yeah, it's it's a rear engine car with swing axle suspension. There were quite a few cars that were built like that. I mean, like the original, like the original 356 Porsches and the original 911s, things like that. Yeah. The Beetle. Yep. Like, but yeah. the problem is, is that a lot of drivers don't know how to handle a rear engine car with swing axle suspension. So at some point they're going to do something stupid and it's going to roll over. Yeah, well, Americans yeah. don't know how to turn corners, so. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't also, really comment after telling you about my uh, Aveo rollover, so continue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, as you'll see if you read it, like, I put the Fisker Karma right at the bottom because I think that is the ultimate example of a car that should have been really good but ended up being really awful. You know, Absolutely. that one, yeah, that one I can get behind because it, it was definitely better looking and better interior than the Tesla. I mean, like, and, uh, it's designed by the same guy who designed the Aston Martin DB9, which is one of the best yeah. looking cars. Ever. It has yeah. Aston Martin. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, yeah. And, like, yeah, yeah, Henrik Fisker, like, it should have done well. Like, Henrik Fisker was this huge, respected name in the industry. He's like one of the most like celebrated automotive designers of all time. He designed the BMW Z8, the DB9, V8 Vantage. He was an assistant on the Vanquish. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. as well. Like, he's designed all sorts of incredible, like, really fantastic-looking cars. 
And so, like, he tries to go into the car business for himself and be like, oh, maybe he'll do something good. Well, because it's because he'll probably have all the right contacts or whatever. And yeah, it just ended up being a really terrible car. I mean, like, the concept wasn't even that bad, but the problem, it was just executed so poorly. Well, I yeah. mean, it, amongst all the other obvious things that's wrong with it, the interior packaging of it was horrible like oh yeah it was such a long car but the back seat you could barely get an adult back there i don't even know yeah, hey, without you being whoa, super whoa. squish but that doesn't matter because you can get alligator skin as interior leather so that that was the most important thing <laughs> yeah they're down there in louisiana cutting them all up and getting them in there <laughs> yeah they're like cutting up an alligator like what are you doing that for oh some fisker guy wants a wants leather seats for his car or so I'll get this sorted. It's it's, it's, it's it's a wonder that it didn't sit well with environmentalists, that car, isn't it? It's a small yeah. yeah. But I guess um I guess you can always have your Gordon Murray's and then I guess you have your Henry Fiskers too. So not everybody I guess could be Gordon. Yeah, true. Yeah, it's it is it is just generally one of those things where it should have been so good because there is this celebrated automotive designer and you'd think that he'd know all the right people to kind of get to put to put together to make this thing but like it was all a, it was a huge messy combination why Fisker just went tits up and the car was bad and there was all sorts the, of like the, the other thing though is those designers sometimes I think get complacent in their ways because they've done so many good cars that they just think they can breeze oh, through this definitely I think you I was doing my like, I have a, a video, this is not a plug, it just leads in properly, but I'm doing a video tomorrow on the uh, Bugatti EB110, which I recorded yesterday. So I've edited that today, but one of the things I noticed about it was, it was uh, Marcello Gandini uh, designed the car, and he designed the Countach, the Alfa Romeo Montreal, they did a thing about, he, like tons and tons of beautiful looking cars were done by Gandini, he's a really famous guy, and then he went and designed the EB110 for Bugatti for Atioli. And when he brought it, they hated it because he did it all wedge-shaped like the Countach, and they hated it. And then his next job after that was to design the Diablo for Chrysler, and he did the same thing, and they hated it. So he just, like, all these designs that had worked from in the past just stopped working, and it took him years to, like, get another decent job of, of something, you know? So I think these guys just get complacent in their own ways, and it kind of backfires on them. Oh, definitely. Yeah, it sucks. That, and, um, he did... Fisker did definitely have an ego about him. I mean, like you could probably write do an entire documentary film about why about Fisker just screwing everything up. I mean, there's probably enough material for that, you know. Well, yeah. going back to that, aren't yeah. they back now? Fisker kind of got bought up by a Chinese company, right? Yeah, well, the original doing, Fisker company did, yeah. yeah, but he's also got his own new company where he's developing some new stuff. Yeah, the Fisker Ocean, I think, actually looks really cool. Absolutely. Like, I really, yeah. I really All hope Fiskers that, look good, regardless. I really hope that this time around, Fisk, like, Henry Fisker doesn't make a mess of it, because I do really like the concept behind the ocean with the solar panels on the roof and all that kind of thing. Yeah, it's a cool-looking SUV, and I think... Um, no, I think with the Chinese involved, it should be good. And I think we've also just lost... Uh... Have we lost people? Or... We're all here? We all here? Yeah, I'm here. I okay. Hear all right. I think video streams or something just dropped. <laughs> or is it just me? Technical glitch. We're all good. We'll be back after these short messages. Have you had problems getting an erection lately? Um, so, <laughs> are you guys still there though? Yeah, because oh, you're popping back up now. The video's dropped from me. I don't know if it's my connection or someone else, but it doesn't matter. It's all back now. Um, so, can I quickly move on to something, and then we'll move on to to you, uh, uh, Charles and Alex, actually, because you've got some cool things there. But I just want to mention something that has kind of peeved me, which is. The new Mini E, which I think I spoke about a couple of weeks ago on this, uh, BMW gave it a 110 mile range. And I know it's a city car, but that seems pointless. And I know they're trying to go like sub 20 grand, but it even more annoyingly to me is the Fiat 500E, the new one uh, that's been built from the ground up that just got announced. 
Uh, that'll be out later this year, and it's got 199 miles, and that is a smaller car. So I know you get the weight ratio as well, but they can pack way more batteries into like a into a mini and still keep the space. So I don't know about you guys, but I think on cars that should have been good but won't be, I think we probably will be adding the Mini E at some point in future. And the Mini E at some point for the second time, because the one they released in 2009 was a failure as well. Well, I mean, all small cars. I think I wrote an article about this a few months back. All small cars in the U.S. market, or even in the North American market, I don't see them living all that much longer. They're just not selling as well as they did before. Like, if you look at the Volkswagen Beetle, that just got canceled. The Fiat 500 of Barth, I think, got not not canceled, but taken out of the U.S. market. They're still being sold in yeah. Europe, but yeah, they're just not the US just selling as well. For, yeah, yeah well, the U.S. Man. place for small cars, like... Yeah, because the uh, you got the Barth, you got the well, the five, you got the five hundred, you got the Golf, and you have the Mini. Um, those would be all cars that are taking those names, making them electric. That way, they can, as it, we talked about last week, the electric cars getting the the names, they can live on, and then they can still have that, you know, that hot hatch fandom, and. You know, the Golf E I had, or the E Golf I had, that had crap range too. That had only a hundred miles. But it was yeah. it's a it's a great start though. If you if you're a hot hatch fan, you have the electric car and it still has the maneuverability of like the golf, because I had a golf before then. It had everything the golf has, minus it's being quiet. True. And I and I guess to Alex's point as well, if they're not gonna sell that well in Northern America then it probably doesn't really matter because if you're driving and you're living in Dublin or London or Rome or Paris, 100 miles is probably more than enough for a day's driving for most people. So, and also, kind of to add to that point, you look at what's popular in the U.S. right now. It's giant SUVs and pickups, and they're just getting bigger and bigger and bigger every year. At some yeah. point, it gets intimidating just coming in town with your little Fiat and they just go around and you just see like a massive cyber truck that could pretty much run you over, you know? You know, I, I've been driving a little say at Ibiza recently and I completely get that because before that I was driving my 87 Chevy pickup and that thing was big, especially if I'm European. So that to me was like the biggest thing in the road. But now driving a say, it's like I'm looking up at everything. So yeah, I, I can I can get that. That must be pretty intimidating. Uh, speaking of intim- intimidating... Um, there's a car here called a Palisade, Alex, and I believe it's by Hyundai. Um, yeah, and if you say it's better than an Alfa Romeo, I'm throwing you off the roof this time, Charles. <laughs> what? Well, so on the surface, it sounds kind of boring, but this actually started off as an April Fool's prank. The end division of Hyundai, Hyundai, however you want to pronounce it, they made the Palisade and they gave it a giant like they gave it the end treatment they gave it like front splitter they designed they gave it its famous kind of like orange red color with the light blue and all that and uh, i noticed that it had a huge following of a bunch of people who wanted to make it or who wanted it made maybe a number of people that were ready to buy it so and the way that i look at it too our market in the United States, you're lucky if you see a red car. Typically, you're seeing white, silver, or black. Like yes. Cars like that would be nice to see on the road. Yeah. But the, the only problem with that is if you change the color of a car that's a kind of not like a high-end car, you know what I mean? Like not an expensive car. The primary reason you have those three colors is because of depreciation. And people know it'll be harder to sell like a bright orange car uh, than it will be to sell a gray one. So I don't know if Hyundai can take those risks because it doesn't really have that, you know. I don't think I could ever a Palisade and just I don't think it would work either because it's only meant for families. And I drove one and it was horrible. I might have talked. Greatly, I might have talked greatly about that Kia Seltos last week, but that Hyundai that was a complete opposite. That that it's not as bad as the old Hyundai's, but 
it's not as good as you could think that they are now. Yeah. I mean, Rob, you could happily drive one in Wales where the population is 90% sheep, so you wouldn't get insulted as much. Oh, so it's too, big, for, it, too big for the UK. I mean, like, there's... I mean, like, to put into context, you're like, um, there's a guy in Swansea who drives around in a Ram 1500, and that oh, is God. massive compared to, yeah. like, literally everything else on the road. <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine living back in Dublin with, like, a Ram pickup truck, because the streets I mean, no, are just way too small. Got them. And, like, I get, I mean, I'd, to be honest with you, I'd quite like to have a Ram. It would be hilarious, but, like... yeah. I'd it's on my of, list for yeah. car of, I want to buy this year is a Ram Laramie double cab. I love them. Yeah, probably but like, an unpopular yeah. opinion here, but my favorite pickup is the Ram fifteen hundred Limited. Love it. It's nice. I don't have yeah, any favorite. The problem favorite is with having like an F one hundred and fifty or a Ram or a Silverado or whatever in the UK is that they're so big <laughs> compared to everything else. Yeah, <laughs> it's very difficult yeah. to get places yeah. sometimes. Yeah, the only the only truck I actually like is my father in law's eighty nine F one fifty, and that's just because it has sentimental value to me, and that's it. Yeah, I I love pickup trucks though, and I hated them before I came here. But I would, I, I want a big pickup truck. I want like I want to just I, I love playing the Canyon Arrow song from The Simpsons when I was driving my old one because oh, it God, was. Remember, I was actually saying about this on Twitter the other day. So, like, do you remember when the press photos for the Rolls Royce Cullinan first came out and they chose what the press car that, and the photos was bright red? So everyone was making the Canyon Arrow jokes. <laughs> and I, I, I don't want to get too far off track, but the Cullinan is a disgusting looking, horrible car. The Cullinan uh, is basically the real life version of the Canyon Arrow. That yeah, is. Just... I don't know. I don't. I don't think it looks all that bad. I wouldn't call it ugly at all. When's the last time you went to an optician for a regular checkup? I've no doubt the Cullinan's a really fantastic car. It just it just looks quite unfortunate, especially it's in just, red. It just looks like someone lifted a phantom and then repeatedly smashed it into a wall. It looks yeah. not as this, bad though as this, my. Uh, this, it's not as bad though as my neighbor's pink Bentley. Oh, um, that, oh I saw, I saw, uh, um, Yeah, my um, my neighbor's long. wife. Okay, basically put like, put it this way: uh, one of my neighbors owns the largest car supermarket in the whole of Europe. Right. And they lives have an eight million Bentley. lives in an eight million pound mansion, and he and they have like a ridiculous amount of cars. Like they have stupid wealthy. And his wife, um, insisted on having a pink Bentayga. Uh, <laughs> if, I was, if I was her husband I would have smashed it into a wall or maybe put it in the river well, um, her, hus- her husband's got a lot better taste in cars because he's got a Lamborghini Urus and a Bugatti Chiron so. okay. he has a Chiron yeah he does Yeah, it's. Uh, I saw it once it was quite something I'm not too thrilled about Chirons or the Bugatti Chiron I, d- I, d- I don't know why I just ew well, yeah, I guess they're trying, they're a, trying yeah, so hard to make all sorts well. of. Not really. I'm not oh, really sure how many cars he has, but I know for a fact he's got the uh, the Euros and the show on his wife's got the pink Bentley. And I think he has a Phantom drop head as well. I'm I'm I'm, I'm I don't want to stereotype here, but I'm guessing his wife is thin, blonde, and has one of those small little yappy dogs, because I can't picture anyone else with a pink Bentley. Apart well, from the yappy dog, you yeah, nailed yeah. it. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, cool. <laughs> well, the issue that I've been having so far with Bugatti is they're trying to make so many... It's like they're trying to squeeze as much as they can out of the Chiron to kind of make as much money out of it, kind of. That's what it feels like. Yeah, they first came out with, with the, the Chiron, and well. then it was cool. But then they came out with the Chiron Per Sport, which is supposed to be a track Chiron, yet they came out with the Divo a few months earlier, which is... A better track version of the Veyron, of the yeah, Chiron, yeah. excuse me. And then they yeah, came out with the SS Sport, which is like the top speed model. <laughs> and then they not, funnily and then enough, they actually, like a, a black there's edition. somebody in Swansea as well right. who's got a, a Veyron Grand Sport, and it's like white on white. Hang hey, on. Well, like, what are all these people doing in Wales with these cars? This there's, is ridiculous. There's, there's quite a few people with a lot of money in Swansea. Um, like there's quite a there's quite a few people with a lot of money here in Mexico too, but 
I, I can never find out exactly what they do for a living. They're quite closed about it. Yeah, one of, the people, one of the people down the road from me has got one of the Holy Trinity cars as well. Like, it's probably like he's got a 918. Like, my, my, I remember one of the craziest things for me here in Mexico was I was coming back. I had to fly up to Tijuana, and uh, that's, a, that's a crazy place. But anyway, I had to fly up to Tijuana, cross the border into uh, the States, they were asking a load of questions about what I was doing. I was like, look, I'm just trying to scam the system and renew my visa. So I'm heading back to Mexico, like in literally an hour. They were like, OK, cool. So anyway, I'm coming back. I'm driving my pickup truck back uh, from the airport back to my house here in Jalisco. And all of a sudden, this like massive white Chevrolet Suburban like barrels past me at about 100 miles an hour. And then another one like a second later at 100 miles an hour. And then all of a sudden, there's a Ferrari 612 in bright, like in white as well, just races past me at about 120 with a, a Suburban trying to keep up right up its ass, like behind it, followed by two more Chevrolet Suburbans. And immediately I thought to myself, ah, that must be some sort of wealthy, legitimate business owner. Definitely not something nefarious. Uh, but that was like my first time seeing a, a clear cartel head like driving past me because it's like no one else would need that much security, you know? Wow. <laughs> so, like, he had, so he had like an entire motorcade. Yes. I mean, generally speaking, it looked way better than if Trump passed me or something. Because, you know, you'd have like your Cadillac Escalades, but you would never see Trump driving like a Ferrari 612 at 120 in like, I think was a 60s home. <laughs> Although it's not it's not that that it's hard hard. Hard. Yeah. Well, he actually, my car. <laughs> kind of revolving a bit not about cars, I saw that in Mexico, the cartels are actually giving care packages to people that have nothing to do with, like, drugs or any of that. Like, they're just giving packages with, like, rice and soap and all that. The government came out and they were like, stop it. Yeah, like, being so completely honest with you... Yeah. yeah, like, being completely honest with you, the, the whole situation down here is... Like, it's not as bad as people make it out on the TV unless you're near the border. Like, I will agree that if you live near the border of U.S.-Mexico, Mexico is fucking dangerous. Like, it's it's like, for example, I wouldn't want to live in Tijuana. That is literally Tijuana is a great place for a stag party or something like a bachelor party. Um, but I wouldn't want to live there because it's as close to hell as you can get without tunneling. Um, like, you know, it's, it's just a horrible place. Um, but the rest of Mexico is beautiful. Mexican people are lovely. Um, but the cartel situation, like in Jalisco, for example, we have the biggest cartel in the world here. Uh, but they tend to have this kind of unspoken rule where they're like, look, we won't hurt any innocent people. You don't stop our roots and everything just kind of continues on. And it's kind of this, you know, just non-spoken thing. Um, so we don't see any violence down here. Um, and sorry to get back to cars, I will in a second. Just there was a hilarious story earlier this year. The US government paid for 500 Mexican military uh, to go up to the States, train with Navy SEALs about three years ago, and they spent $25 million on the project. And they were going to come down and be an elite cartel fighting task force. Uh, they've returned, and earlier this year, they start, those 500 military started their own cartel. And now the US government is having a problem dealing with them. Uh, I just think that's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, I, what, what, what's on the to bite you in the ass? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I didn't see that coming. Oh my God. I would say if it's I had like some advice, it's like when Zimbabwe introduced their own currency again last year and now they're on the brink of having another hyperinflation crisis. <laughs> yeah, what is it? A banana is like five million Zimbabwean dollars or something. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Like. <laughs> Um, I'll try and move us back to cars before I say something stupid like America stay out of our business um, so uh, Charles you found a cool article on drive tribe that you sent over about uh, was it one or two guys who used their drive tribe money to buy a, a Fiat Multipla it was uh, there were three brothers uh, the article was written by Jonathan Yarden and uh, him and his brother saved up enough money it, they put it on here it equals about 830 pounds and a little over a thousand dollars you know how that equates and they were able to save up and buy a fiat multipla um now i've never seen a fiat multipla i can't tell you in person how it looks but uh, I, they, they say it was, a, it was awesome. the most perfect car that they could find 
Uh, but at first they wanted, uh, you know, their viewers to help them pick the car and whatnot. But they found it before anybody could answer it. And then they they go on and talk about how it was Top Gear's best car in twenty and two in the two thousand. And yet, it also made the ugliest car in 2000. So, um, it was disgusting. It's it's the perfect example of function over form. Like, it was a fantastic car for families, very functional, lots of space, very well made, but just hideous looking. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. They found it in Switzerland. And it was right, listed okay. for 650 uh, pounds, or, and it has 143,000 miles on it. And it was appraised less than three years ago, which means they were able to register it, they said. And, yeah. um, but it, was, it wasn't even badly equipped. It actually had uh, a JVC radio, which was a state-of-the-art aftermarket you know, system. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> a USB cable and, and even a three and a half jack. Um, wow. It also has, uh, it, it, they said also here that it was electronically equipped with parking sensors and adjustable exterior mirrors with working air conditioning. So, oh, wow. For 650. It's actually not bad for close to a thousand. What's that? 660, 50 Swiss francs or pounds. Yeah, so that's like. Yeah, probably about seven hundred dollars or something. I would imagine. Yeah, they yeah. they have they have the they, they promise that they're going to be taking trips with it. They're going to document it and all that other stuff because that's what they want to. That's what they want to do. And yeah, uh, they, they said to follow them on Instagram at Cars Recreation. Yeah, you know, that way we can follow. Well, I, have a, I, I want to do something like that as well. Like I have a I have a thing in the back of my head that. The reason I'm kind of pushing, even though I'm not getting huge views on my YouTube videos, the reason I'm pushing every day is because the moment I get that audience, I have an idea, which is to basically get uh, do a Top Gear style uh, used car challenge, but make it super difficult. Basically, you have to land in uh, Cancun, buy a used car for less than uh, $1,500. Now, it can be any used car, and you'd think that would be easy, but car prices in Mexico don't depreciate, so it's really difficult to find a cheap car. Um, so you're going to end up in either a Beetle, a Nissan Suru, or something really terrible. Um, and then I want to do like a basically a 4,000 kilometer trip from there to Tijuana and try and cross the border in your Mexican car. And uh, that'll I'll, be, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be awesome. yeah, I want to do it next year, definitely. So, uh, we Maybe maybe we get some people who are on the podcast and put it together. Like it doesn't have to be three people. We could get like six or whatever, and you know, yeah. do like a. Fun we gotta, how would we do? We do. Would we videotape it, or would we like? Well, this pictures? is why I want to get like sponsors, so we could afford like a proper kind of production outfit, like sure. drones and stuff like sure. that. You know. So you want like so three or four people? Kind of what? Car well, track. What? Uh, car track exactly. Yeah. Similar to that, but with really shitty cars. Because, yeah. like, yeah. their thing was, like, are we going to make it? It's like, well, look, you've got $60,000 cars. Like, you're probably going to make it 1,200 miles. I know it's a Lamborghini and a Ferrari, but you're probably going to make it 1,200 miles. I want this to be, you're not sure if this car will make it 10 feet. Like, that's how yeah, cheap. That was, my that was my IROC I just sold. It, it probably would get me at least 100 miles because, one, the speedometer didn't work. The, the tachometer didn't work. My fuel gauge didn't work. My oil pressure gauge didn't work. The only thing that worked was my battery. The yeah. battery. And it was carbureted V8 with a manual transmission. With yeah. a vacuum leak. I, I didn't know about. So it would so, stall time. Rob, do you think we can get you over from Swansea to, to, to take place in a Mexican challenge? I've never been to Mexico in my life. <laughs> I don't, hey, I don't know if I'd be able to cope with all the heat, to be honest. But like, <laughs> put it yeah, in your calendar for next year. <laughs> yeah, the only time I've left the country. Well, the, pro well, the problem is, I'm kind of, I'm kind of planning to go to Canada at some point because I discovered I have a load of family that I never knew out about in Canada. So, where about yeah, Canada? Awesome. Um, Cal easily Cal come down here. Then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I went to Quebec, and in Quebec City, Montreal. I even got to drive on the uh, F1 circuit there. I was actually oh, quite nice. I recorded it. Yeah. I recorded it. I was in Quebec the Volvo is... 
I drove it. I I went a little faster than what they said to, just so I can go into the <laughs> And uh, I actually rather have the uh, my favorite right now car, actually, to take back what I said last week, is the Volvo. I thought about it after I said that. I'm like, nope, it's the Volvo S60. Well, uh, the, the, the the Montreal, thing, though, like, uh, all a used of Quebec, car challenge in Mexico awesome, could be really? quite fun, though, because, like, if you did something like that in the UK, you would like, buy a car for, like, less than one and a half grand. Everyone would just buy, like, a really old Volvo or a Saab or something like that. Well, the, the thing is, and I know from the market in Ireland, for example, my first car was 300 euros, like, which is, like, $300 almost. So, like, you know, you can buy a car that will keep going for that kind of price. Like 1500 is actually a decent amount to buy a car with. Um, whereas in Mexico, 1500 is not because what happens is your cars depreciate for like five years and then they kind of stick at the same price. Like my 87 Chevrolet, which was in bits, I bought for two grand and sold for two and a half. You know what I mean? So like wow. that, that it's not worth that much in the States. You know, like it would probably have sold for like $500 or something. So it's going to be, I think it would be trickier to do it here. And also, this country is stunning and interesting. So I think just the whole drive from Cancun to Tijuana, seeing the entire country would be amazing as well. Like you drive up the coastline. Yes, yeah, so you're starting. Get like a, I guess if I could get like a bay window transporter or something like that, that would probably be like a good one for me. Well, I, I have in my head, I'll probably buy a combi for the laugh and just pick up people on the way. Like, yeah, like you know, just like pick up people on the way, but literally just go, hey, can you make food? And they're like, yeah, oh, come with us. We're going to Tijuana. Like, OK. Hey, are you a mechanic? Yeah, yeah, come with us. We're going to. So I like you, everyone else is breaking down, but I'll have like a mechanic and a cook in my car. Like at all times. We'll have a whole crew with us. Yeah. That and I will have awesome. so I can speak fluent Spanish now. So that's going to be a, a nice help. I just that think it'd be funny. <laughs> well, you just use, I can just see you guys using Google Translate, you know, like it'd be much more kind of Jeremy Clarkson esque, you know, just, just shouting at people. <laughs> well, I could, I could speak a little bit of Spanish. I'd be able to get through, probably. Okay. Simple statement. Well, if, um, if you're in doubt, you can always use the universal point, as one of my friends in college used to call it, where you just thought, I want to go there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or you, or you kind of like make the signs or you point at something on your, like, your phone or something like that or a picture. Yeah. yeah. Well, if it makes you guys feel any better, I, I landed here with two phrases, or no, three. I could say hola, which is hello, obviously, as you probably know. I could say gracias, which is thank you. And I could say una cerveza, por favor, which is just a beer, please. Uh, yeah, I, I like work that. with a whole bunch of people at my job for Spanish. At my, uh, at my essential job, there's at least four or five people who speak Spanish, and one of them isn't the best English speaker, so I had to talk to him in Spanish a little bit too, so I can help yeah. out. Well, you you'd love. Uh, I think if we if we ever pull this trip off, definitely need to try and get some of you guys involved because you would love driving culture here. For example, if you drive too fast, it's just a fine. You won't get any hassle. Like you could do two hundred miles an hour and just get a fine. Um, brake lights and lights on your car in general seem relatively optional. Um, okay. which is it's kind of scary at night when I see like I'm coming up quite quickly say in the car and all of a sudden I realize there's a motorbike in front of me and he's got no lights on and it's pitch black and that just seems to be normal here um, license plates seem to be optional as long as you don't want to go on highways um, yeah there's a lot of optional driving features in, in Mexico um, so I think if we can do it in Mexico first and then maybe head down to like Medellin, Colombia, we just make this more and more dangerous each year. Uh, oh, I, have, and, I have the ultimate road trip in mind if I could ever pull it off. And that is if I started the very northern tip of Alaska yeah. and I drive all the way down to the very southern tip of Argentina, I'd love to pull that off. Oh, yeah. I don't awesome. think you can do that because there's no actual roads. In you, like there, there, there's, a, there's a bit of strip of land somewhere in Columbus. Central America. It's, where in, there's like yeah, no it's, it's Panama. It's going from Panama to Colombia. I think it is, or Panama to Venezuela. There's a, a delta there, and it's 50 kilometers of really tough terrain. So you'd have to do it in like a Defender or a Range Rover or something that could wade through quite a substantial amount of water. Um, otherwise, you can... 
Well, the other option, what a lot of people do is they, they kind of bring their car down and then they get a boat across and their car just basically sits on the boat and you can just go across on the boat and they continue on down. So there's ways around it. Yeah, because yeah, I, yeah. I heard of somebody who did something like that in an old TVR and I was like, well, you're brave. <laughs> yeah, he did it. Yeah, in, sorry, yeah. he, can't, he did it in Russia and he went somewhere else. He, he actually went from Russia, drove across Europe, took a boat, or, or had it shipped over to America, drove it around America, and then s- just went south after that. I remember. In a TVR. One- He's yeah, a I person. remember. I followed him. He did. It. He also did a lot of stuff. He did something in a Porsche. I think it was like a 944. Um, he, he did that all around Africa. He took an old Corvette, like an 80s Corvette, drove it around Asia, Um <laughs> He, he inspired me to come up with this trip, like north to south, two continents. Yeah. That's it. But that's what you have for. to do it in something unreliable, though. You can't do it in like a you can't do it in like a German car because you know that's just going to make it and that's going to be very boring. You know, you have to do it in something that you know has a possibility to explode at any point. You know, and yeah, also you're like definitely going to want the top you're definitely going to want something like a Defender, some sort of SUV, something like that, because someday you're going to break down or you're going to end up in the middle of a field at 12 and you won't be able to drive anymore and you're going to need to fall asleep in your car. That's yeah. why I'm making the combi for the Mexico trip because I can just sleep in the back when it breaks down inevitably. Plus, those things have like five parts. How hard could it be to fix? You know, there's a battery. A there's a Ah, oh, wagon would be a good idea. By, yeah. um, like combi, you mean, uh, by combi, you mean the um, you mean the Type Two bay window ones, don't you? Probably. Yeah. Yeah, you. Well, can, the uh, yeah, fact like, that you well, just said is, how hard well, could it be? If the if the engine on those completely dies, like right, you can you can just put a Subaru flat four into them, like straight in. It's a really easy conversion. Yeah. But no, I, I still think, think just. I'm oh, sorry. I was just going to say, I still think I'd cheat on the whole thing, though, because it'd be like, okay, your budget is 30,000 pesos, right? So it's like 1,500 dollars or whatever. It's like everyone goes off. I would buy like a 20,000 or like a really crappy version of it and just like pay a mechanic 10,000 pesos to come with me for the trip. But like keep him kind of off camera the entire time. And it's like, oh, I broke down and I'm just having a cup of coffee. It's like, how's the, how's the van? Yeah, it's good. It's good. How do you keep fixing it? Like, I haven't seen you touch it once. Like, no, it's good. It's good. And then kind of near the end I of the trip. Like, 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 like we'd have to have like we'd have to hire a mechanic as part of the crew just to we make have. sure everyone's cars can actually make it. Because well, that, it's not yeah. really TV to... you don't make it, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, because I don't know it is would the would going and doing that trip in Mexico would that even be as safe if we broke down? It depends where you break down and what time of day. But I mean, that someone getting killed. Off, someone though. getting killed would definitely put the ratings through the roof. So I'm kind of praying That's for that. To be, to, <laughs> to be fair, if you break down to like a scary spot, it just adds to the excitement, yeah. if you will. To yeah, be honest have, with you, 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 yeah, you're you're not gonna have any issues, especially because it's not like you're you're breaking down in like a Ferrari. You're gonna break down in a Beetle. You know, so if you get any issues, they're probably just going to want your car. Like, it's not like it is on the on the films. Like, I don't go to the shop and get mugged by someone who's like, okay, I'm going to kill you and your family. Like, you know, it's just the worst thing that's ever happened to me in Mexico is my wallet got robbed in uh, Tijuana, I think it was. And that's like, that has happened to me in other places, like in Cuba, in Thailand, in Dublin. It's been robbed quite a lot, actually. Uh, I've been, yeah, I, I got pickpocketed. I, uh, I got pickpocketed once in Birmingham. <laughs> you know, like, the guy <laughs> yeah, was a very I, bad pickpocket because he didn't manage to get my wallet. He got my parking ticket instead. <laughs> the worst, the worst for me was when I got pickpocketed in Havana the night before my flight to Cancun. And uh, I basically, I bought a liter bottle of rum and went out onto the Malacone, which is like where everyone sits at like 6 p.m. Got hammered drunk with a lot of Cuban people um, and didn't remember most of the night after, say, an hour. Woke up the next morning, couldn't find my wallet, $200 was gone. Found my wallet eventually with no money in it. And then uh, basically realized that I had no money to buy a ticket to use the internet because you can't just use the internet in Cuba. You have to like pay a dollar to use it. So... 
I had to run to like a park where they had Wi-Fi. And then I miraculously in my bag found one of the tickets with 15 minutes left on it. Had to use the 15 minutes. My mother would not pick up for like 10 minutes. So I've got like four minutes left, I think, at this point. She finally picks up and I'm like, I can't access my account. Can you please just like transfer $20 into it so I know there's money there? Because I have to get a taxi to the airport for a flight in 45 minutes. And I've got no money, no Wi-Fi, and I'm in fucking Cuba. So she's like, yep, yep, I'll send that now. So like I had to run then five kilometers to an APA ATM to get money out to get a taxi to the airport. That's crazy, man. Yeah. Well, Cuba is my favorite country on the planet by far. I'd like to go there. I don't know if we're able to get to go there. From yeah, it's so confusing in the states nowadays. You yeah, can just you just need to fly from uh, if you fly from Canada or, there to yeah. Canada or to to Mexico, you can easily go across and. You just have to pay thirty dollars for your visa, which is like a um, a thirty day visa, and that's it. They don't care actually; they have no problem with Americans coming in. Uh, just the one thing you'll have to watch out for is your debit and credit cards will not work in Cuba, so you need to bring cash. Yeah, so, um, yeah that makes so, sense. Yeah. So, but it, it's if you're a car lover, it's one of the best places in the world because you're just going to see classic cars. Just, yeah, they got. Yeah. There's a show on Netflix. I, uh, if, if I'm correct, where they went to to Cuba and they had this old fifties. I can't. Maybe it's a Chevy or something like that. And it had a Hyundai diesel engine in it because they're so, um, you know, they're so able to just use whatever they can. And yeah. So most make- of the cars are not original anymore. When I was there, I was talking to a taxi driver. So basically, most days I would get taxis everywhere, even if it was a five minute walk, just so I could sit in like a fifty six Cadillac. I was like, it was like five dollars for the taxi. I'm like, just drive me anywhere. I don't care. Just go. Uh, I was talking to one of the taxi drivers, and he said he was telling me that most of the panels, for example, were rebuilt. So they would take the old panels off, get new sheet metal, and rebuild them. Um, and then, yeah, and they were using Lada engines and Chinese engines and Korean engines, just purely because basically the they, there's no new cars from the U.S. allowed to be imported after '59. So any U.S. cars you see there are pre-59. Um, so yeah. you only see the ladders or Chinese cars, and that's it. It's crazy. You're pretty much stuck in a, was it, time? Time it's, capsule. Time, stuck in time? Yeah. It's honestly why I loved it. At the time, I was single, and I was working a crazy amount. And I said, look, I'm going to spend two weeks in Cuba. And I just went to Varadero Beach in Cuba and spent two weeks with no internet, no telephone, uh, old cars, an all-inclusive hotel. And uh, I just literally, it was the most relaxed I think I've ever been. Um, and also, it's super cheap. A liter bottle of rum is three, $3. Um, a cobija, like a uh, Cuban cigar, is $1.50. A packet of cigarettes is, I think, 50 cents in US. Um, yeah, and then I, I found out one night that the uh, there's a club around the corner from the hotel, and it was uh, 100 pesos or sorry, $5 US in entry. Um, but that included everything you wanted to drink for the entire night. So wow. it's just... That sounds like we should yeah. do another trip that way or another you know, car challenge. Yeah. Over in Cuba. Actually, to be honest, if, we, if we could rent cars or something there and do a Cuba trip, that would be amazing as well. I like but, a grand you know, Cuba. wife, but Cuban women are incredible as well. Like, All right. <clears throat> <laughs> But, but for for that for that, Argent, for that trip I was talking about, I would use, uh, I would try to use the Camaro Z28, the one I was, the one I like, a Nissan GTR, and yep. maybe a uh, Civic Type R. So all we got right, well, all-wheel drive and front-wheel drive. Well, let's just follow on then, because now that we've turned this into a travel car podcast, um, yep. so, <laughs> let's just, just quickly that, wrap that, this whole thing up. Let's just wrap this whole thing up because that is a fair one, Charles. If you had to drive around the world, what car would you choose? So, Charles, you've told us you're three. The Alex, Camaro. what would you choose? I would okay, you. <laughs> Alex, what about you? Uh, I would probably do a Mercedes wagon, like an AMG wagon, because you've got power, you've got practicality, you've got pretty much everything. So you can still enjoy a good road. But if you need to bring your family with you, you can still do that. 
Okay. So Fair. if I'm doing it with my family, would be that. If I'm doing it myself, probably like a Mazda Miata or something like that. <laughs> Rob, what about you? Um, easy answer for me, uh, F-150 Raptor. Ah. <laughs> there you go. You'll be pouring us out the mud. Yeah, yeah. It's like, like you're never gonna get stuck. That like you can, it's like pro- proper off-road suspension. So you can get like serious speeds up in the dunes or wherever the hell you go. You can bring people along with you. It's got a good amount of space in the back. Yeah, that would be that would be one possible I'd do. Um, I think maybe an original mini could be quite fun. <laughs> that would be hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> Hilarious and, is the right word for it. And also, because I know somebody's done this, and I think it would be quite fun as well, like a, a London black cab, or like a metro cab, or something like that. Yeah. I personally would probably pick, and there's two reasons why I'm this, I'd pick a new Range Rover, right? For three reasons, actually. Uh, first reason is incredibly comfortable, let's be honest here, right? You know, footballers, wives drive these things, so they have to be comfortable. Um, second is, it is a fantastic off-road car. Like, no matter how luxurious it's gotten, they are actually incredibly capable off-road. And the third reason is that when it breaks down, wherever I am, I would have to take a holiday for about four weeks because the parts would be so difficult to get. So, you know, I mean, if like, I, like, break yeah, it, I mean, it, okay, like, you've got to shoot those parts here. I mean, like, Ginger Baker drove from, like, the UK to Nigeria in a classic Range Rover back in the day, if you've ever heard about that. So, yeah. That's that's the problem with a modern-day Range Rover. They're so incredibly capable, but all that stuff that makes it capable breaks down so frequently. And it's so it's... expensive to so fix them really up. Good. Yeah, it's, it's like, the thing that I, I really hate about all modern cars, which is like, for example, with the 87 truck, right? If something goes wrong nine times out of 10, I can figure it out myself and fix it. And I've learned a lot about mechanics and how engines work just from having that thing for a year. But for example, my sister-in-law's new say uh, Ibiza, she has a brand new one. And it's like, even the spark plugs and stuff, it's like, do you really want to touch that? Because you could upset the computer. You know, like everything is just too... I know. I know. I know. Technology I has made cars so much better, but they've made them so much worse as well in the sense of like fixing your own car and saving money and all that. And yeah. So it usually pays to have an older car instead of a new one. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So on that depressing bombshell, I guess uh, <laughs> we'll probably <laughs> wrap it up there. Um so, uh, yeah, I guess uh, that was a fun uh, car slash travel pl- uh, podcast because I think half of that was just talking about traveling around America. But anyway, that's that's my fault. It's completely a, my uh, fault. Doing a 4,000 kilometers. Hey, it's a great dog. Talk. To talk about. Yeah, yeah, and Rob, like, also, I've talked to everyone on how cartels work down here, too. So, you know, it's been very informative. <laughs> yeah, I right. guess maybe one day we could do the um, the epic Mexican road trip in really rubbish cars that will inevitably break down to the point where we'll have to have a um, a mechanic on the crew just to make sure we actually make it to Tijuana. Yeah, yeah. yeah. security. That would yeah. be super fun, though. Be super it would be an fun. epic road trip, or we could finish the Patagonia special. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'll take the Porsche. Yeah, I'll. Uh, I'll go I ahead and take the Mustang. I'll take the Lotus then. Rob, you can take the backup car. What was the backup car? What was wasn't it? No, no, it wasn't a Beetle, was it? No, that was the Avbots one, a special one. The Beetle was the backup. What was the backup car in, in Patagonia? I'm looking it up right now. I love how, I don't know if you guys watch Joe Rogan, but I love how Alex has kind of become Jamie in the Joe Rogan podcast where he just kind of looks up everything. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> it was the Citroen 2CV. I wouldn't uh, mind yes. driving the 2CV, to be fair. I quite I like the 2CV yes. in a strange so, way. Yeah, you can actually one. get like um, electric conversions for the 2CV now, so you can have an E2CV. Yeah. And I think that is actually like, I think if there's any cars that, that are like ripe, right for like the whole electric conversion thing think 2cv is one of the best ones yeah definitely okay before we wrap up is there any other things that you guys want to talk about or 
Uh, I'm driving. I a, think we uh, pretty uh, much I'm nailed everything. Hyundai. That's it. But that's yeah. that'll be at a review. What are you so, driving? A Hyundai Sonata, the new one. Hey, you yeah, came out and said that that's better than a Mazda Six, which is yeah. Uh, Right. Uh, so is it better than Accord? Would you say that's better than the Accord? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I've never actually. It like the best. In, in my never, opinion, it's the best. So, I've, I've never played. driven one yet, so I can't really say. But styling-wise and interior design-wise, I would definitely say that the Accord and the Six are better so, than the my, no. my thinking is though, Charles last week said a Kia was better than an Alfa Romeo. No, I this never week, said that. I just said it had just as much character. Well, that's just as bad as what I said. Um, so, like, that you said that last week. This week you're saying a Hyundai is better than a Mazda 6. I have a, a question about your reviews. How much do these companies pay you to write them? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing at all. No, it's, 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 it's honestly, it's just my opinion. Now, yeah. I will sit here and I'll tell you that the Palisade sucks. It, because it's 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 boring. It's as boring as anything. And then there's cars like the Veloster N that are fun. You know, these are cars that are more surprising, which is why I like them. Because Hyundai has a bad reputation from everything else. We we know that Mercedes is good. We know Alfa Romeo is good and beautiful. We know all these things about all these other cars. It's just that Hyundai and Kia are stepping up their game, and you can only sit there and appreciate it just as much as you appreciate them as uh, Mercedes and Alpha. That's so true. I give That's them a fair point. That so is fair. Even that, I just want to briefly mention, too, I think we might have mentioned this on a previous podcast, but ever since Hyundai brought in the person who used to take care of the M division at BMW, and now they have the N division for Hyundai, their sports division been doing awesome. Oh, yeah, I'm highly fair. Fair. Yeah, I mean, like, the i30Ns had, like, absolutely rave reviews. I mean, like, people are saying it's one of the best hot hatches. Yeah. Charles is just giving up there. He's like, I'm out of here. <laughs> no, actually, my laptop is dying, so I have to... Oh, okay. Oh, that would be... Yeah, sorry. We'll be wrapping up in a minute anyway. Um, yeah. So, Rob, anything else you want to... Discuss before we terminate. Well, um, well, uh, not really car related, but my Twitter has absolutely exploded because Haley Williams interacted with me. So, <laughs> oh dear God, what? Wow. Yeah. First of all, I... can I just ask a very serious question before I start this? Um, who is Haley Williams? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I, I would like to say that's a joke but I, I at the top of my head right now cannot picture who that is and ladies and gentlemen we have a boomer in the chat yeah <laughs> so I think I'm older than I'm letting on <laughs> she's singer of Panama right Panama yeah yeah I just googled uh, it so uh, okay Panama <laughs> redhead girl well she used yes. to be but she's not anymore yeah, like I, I wrote a tweet. Was a or she was redhead, yeah. So, yeah, so like, I wrote a tweet and I tagged her in it. I didn't think, oh, like I didn't think she'd see it or anything. And then, yeah. like, and then she replies to it, and my Twitter starts blowing up. And I'm just like, okay, yeah. I mean, I thought John Cena following me on Twitter was big enough. This is bigger than that. So, <laughs> John Cena <laughs> followed you on Twitter. He follows, he follows like about 10,000 people though, so it's not that personal. <laughs> How many nudes are you posting every day to get these people to follow you on interact? <laughs> Absolutely uh, nothing. It's a news free zone. <laughs> and Alex, finally, anything you want to talk about? Uh, as always, just thanks for having me, man. No worries. Uh, no, thank okay. you for being on. Um, Charles does... Is Charles back or is it it's still uh, calling? His him. laptop died. Hey, back. There we go. Back. back in. Cool. Hello, sir. Yeah, that, All right. Well, I can't see anybody at the moment because I I, I I done goofed. I was plugging no, in my right. laptop. Well, look, on that technical bombshell, we're going to end anyway. I, I, I keep doing this now because I've been watching to old Top Gear. I keep saying the word bombshell. So <laughs> apologies for that. So, uh, yeah, thank you so much, guys, for joining us. Um, as always, your descriptions of these guys will be in the, uh, in the, the description. 
in the comments. No, to the description. That's what I meant. I meant description. I said description. Stay there. Um, don't forget to like and subscribe. Uh, uh, Alex, Charles, and Robert, thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you for always interesting. This week was great as well because we talked about cars, we covered blogs, we covered pod cartels, travel, the fact that Rob is putting his nudes on Twitter and getting Hayley Williams to look at them. So, yeah. <laughs> I won't stand for this slander. How dare you suggest that I post nudes on face on social media? Well, I, I said Twitter, you said Facebook. It's not my fault you're adding to where you're posting your nudes. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget to like and subscribe. This has been the Cardinal Talks. <laughs>